about 6.02 p.m. and the call was to COVID-19, regular meetings and public hearings on Clark County's Historic District will be held in a hybrid format with both in-person and virtual participation options for commissioners, staff, and the public. This will allow for safe participation by commission members, staff, and any citizen of the county. Those of you joining remotely via computer, you should be able to see tonight's meeting agenda now on the screen. Members of the public and applicants that have joined remotely are queued, which means you can see and hear the agenda or you can just hear the event if you join by phone. Other event participants will not see your video. Anyone that is here today in person, please make sure to mute your microphone. On the microphone by pushing the button on the raise hand or off by clicking the phone button. This evening's agenda is planned as follows. Roll call and introduction, prior meeting and motion approval, public comment on subjects other than public hearings on the current issue. about the need for documentation on the review process for measures Vancouver Heritage Overlay Review for 6149. Committee updates and announcements, elections to chair and vice chair, old business and updates, consider the order, and agenda. I'd like to start this meeting by welcoming our newest member of the Historic Preservation Commission, Elaine Thatcher. Elaine comes to us with degrees in anthropology and art history and professional work Austin Society of America, Oregon Museum of Science and Design, Fort Vancouver National Historic Center. Welcome, Elaine. We're delighted to have you. We'll now have roll call of the HPC members present for this meeting. Commission members, please say, I'm here, after I call your name. Ader. Present. On. Morgan Frazier. Here. Greg Cruz. Here. Elaine Thatcher. I'm here. Moving on to meeting notes approval. Does anyone have any comments on the draft June 1 meeting notes? If not, I'd accept an emotion and motion for approval of the June 1 meeting notes. by Commissioner Davis. Second. Frazier has seconded the motion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 We'll now take public comment on any items besides today's meeting items. Please keep remarks brief and to the point. You have a few minutes. Susan will provide instructions on how to make public comment for joining us through their computer or mobile device, and for those of you who are joining by phone or email. For attendees using their computer or WebEx application, if you'd like to speak, please utilize the raised hand icon. You can do this by clicking the participant button or icon, the location of which depends on the device you are using. Staff will only acknowledge those attendees during the comment period who have raised their hand uh, by selecting the hand icon. When you are acknowledged, you will be unmuted. When you have finished your comment, please click the hand icon again to lower your hand. 
for attendees using the telephone audio only option, you need to press star 3 on your phone's number panel to raise your hand. When you are acknowledged, you will be unmuted, and when you finish your comment, press star 3 to lower your hand. Please note public comment is limited to three minutes per person in order to accommodate all speakers. And we have Holly Chamberlain with her hand up, so I will unmute you now. Good evening, Holly. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good evening, commissioners, staff, and guests. I know that there's been some trouble hearing me uh, in the past, and I'd like to confirm that you all can hear me this evening. All right, I think we're, I think we're okay. Thank you. I, uh, it's been coming and going a little bit on, on your end. So, uh, thank you for your patience if we miss a few words here and there. So, we have some good news at Providence Academy on the porch reconstruction and rehabilitation front. Uh, the wood for the West porch reconstruction has arrived and has been painted. Uh, despite our mostly good weather, there still have been some rain delays that have been problematic for the completion, but they've uh, made some good progress on that. Our land use plan for the renovations of the southeast parking lot and related work uh, were submitted to the city for review on June 28th, and uh, theirs are under review right now. The 90 day demolition demolition delay for the smokestack to allow time for the public to suggest feasible alternatives uh, began on March 30th and concluded on June 29th. Pledges totaling $3,900 from nine donors were received and uh, the trust did not receive any proposals for alternatives to demolition. And the dedicated email address for inquiries was not utilized. We have submitted an outreach report to the city. Shomer and Sons contractors returned to the site on June 23rd to begin work on the final phase of North Porch rehabilitation and repairs and the accompanying accessibility improvements. This, this phase is for repairs to the Northeast porches and East entrance. Uh, Shomer expects to be done around the end of July. Over on the officer's row side of the freeway, we have uh, good news that phase two of our heritage capital project funding application for Howard house re roofing and siding and gutter repairs has been submitted and the Washington state historical society review is complete. We just learned today that the application will move forward to the statewide peer review scheduled for August. Thank you again to all of the commissioners for the letter of support that you provided. That kind of backing goes a long way in getting a positive review on these applications. The trust partnered with the Vancouver Barracks Military Association for a public lecture on June 23rd titled The U.S. Army's Love Affair with Coffee, which highlighted the creation of the first Army Post Exchange at the base here, which, if you did not know, was the first in Army history. The trust was pleased to host another Repair Clark County free public repair session. This one happened at the Artillery Barracks uh, in June, which is another great way to connect people with historic buildings. The first summer fest celebration on July 3rd was a giant success. We had an estimated 67,000 people come to the site this past Sunday to enjoy games like giant checkers, horseshoes, cornhole, use the climbing wall, enjoy the bubble show and more, all leading up to the public outdoor movie. It was just wonderful to have that many people in person on the site once again. In terms of announcements, you may be interested to hear that the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation has a new report out on the economic resiliency of Washington's main streets, and you can find that report at preservewa.org. Thank you. Appreciate your time and attention.
<laughs> Please introduce yourself and uh, we can continue the public. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Gib Masters. My wife, Joanne, is here with me. And we're closing uh, on the Peter Flynn House next week over on 20th. And so I just wanted to come introduce myself. I'll let you know we'll probably be back, hopefully, uh, the meeting next month to uh, tell you about the plans for the house um, and uh, a certificate of appropriateness we're going to need for one item that we're, we're planning to do. But I want to meet you, uh, sit through a meeting, see how things uh, work, and then we'll be back uh, hopefully next month. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming. Very good. Any further public comment? Seeing none, it is now my pleasure to introduce former Clark County Historic Preservation Commission Chair, all. Alex is going to talk to us about um, the need for documentation and review process prior to demolition of this. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, good to be here and see everyone. And okay, um, <clears throat> so I've got I put together this presentation back in 2019, um, and I mean you can get it up there and look at the first the title page. Um, so a few of the things might be a little bit outdated, and um, I kind of went over it today, and it's the first time I've looked at it in two and a half years. So um, it might be a little not as smooth as it was when I gave it before. Um, so uh, yeah, and at the time I was uh, vice chair of the uh, commission, so um, it might seem presenting it as part of the commission because I was presenting it at conferences outside of the commission and I wanted to plug the commission a little bit as I went, so um, there we are. Um, and it begins with a little bit of what the Clark County uh, Historic Preservation Commission does and what it is, and I think I can skip that portion um, of the presentation. So. Yeah, so can you do the slideshow portion? Okay, because there are a few slides that um, have like transitions. Okay, so um, the problem. Currently, there's no type of review mechanism built into the demolition permitting process in any jurisdiction in the county um, to address historic properties unless the structure is on the Clark County Heritage Register or is within one of the two historic overlay zones in the uh, city of Vancouver. Uh, during the 1950s and 60s, with the push for urban renewal, uh, so much uh, history, not only in Clark County, but around the country, was, was lost. And that realization led to the formation of, um, well, the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, uh, BLGs, historic preservation commissions like this one. Um, and it helped slow some of the demolition that we saw occur, especially in urban centers. But we're seeing another uh, pulse of demolition and development now, uh, particularly here in the, in the Northwest and in Clark County, is population is, is booming. And we have no mechanism for uh, protecting these historic, particularly the historic homes. Uh, you know, and once these buildings get demolished, they're pretty much gone forever. And, okay, let's see, get caught up on the... That's right.
space bar are we? Uh, that one right there. Okay. So how do I know that this situation happens? So in my day job, I'm an archaeologist here in, in Vancouver, and I happen to do a lot of small-scale surveys called predeterminations in Clark County and the city of Vancouver. Uh, without getting too deep into the history and process of the archaeological predetermination, it was intended to be a sort of survey light triggered by proposed development projects. The focus of the predetermination was very much on archaeological resources and not on the built environment. However, beginning in 2008, Clark County transferred the review responsibility of the reports to the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation in Olympia, in Olympia, the state agency that has responsibility for historic preservation in the state. And over time, DAP, the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, began questioning the fates of the existing structures within the predetermination project areas. For those that were to be demolished as part of the project, DAP began requesting that structures be recorded on the Washington Historic Property Inventory, the HPI. When a locally conceived process mixes with a state review process, there is bound to be gaps. Next slide, please. The HPI is simply an inventory. It, is, it does not have restrictions. It is simply an inventory. And um, in Washington State, a, a historic structure is defined as older than 50 years old. And we're seeing a lot of the houses that are, meet that criteria and are, are 100 year old, years old and older being demolished. Um, the Clark County Property Information website has, does a really good job documenting the structures that exist at a property. Um, and I'll get into that a, a little bit later. Um, but when we go out to do these predeterminations, we often, before we get out in the field, we look to see on the Clark County um, assessors page what the age of the structures are that are out there. Um, if we know that they're over 50 years old, we're going to take we, you know, we, get, we prepare ourselves to take photos and document the structure. Um, next slide, please. But a lot of times when we show up, and so the, the previous slide showed a house, and I know it was really hard to see if you could go back to that one, but if you, so we did, we did, and it's hard for you guys to see, but this house was constructed in, ooh, I can't even read it on my slide, but 1918. 1918, and the HPI on it says that it was determined eligible by DAP. So we knew it was already recorded, but when we got out there, what we found was this hole in the ground, this depression in the ground. Um, next slide. So this, that house was demolished between 2009 and 2011. We figured that out by looking at aerial photographs. But at least this one had an HPI filled out for it, so it was at least documented. Next slide, please. Um, here's another one where it looks like it was constructed in 23, 1923 with an effective build date of something in the 40s. Um, yeah, 1920, and it has a nice building card. So this is all publicly accessible on the Clark County Assessor's webpage on the property information. Um, you know, and it's, I mean, it gives you the dimensions of the house and when it was built, and I, I love the old photographs. Um, but next, or next slide, but when, okay, and then, yeah, we did our, our research, and you can see in that photo the structures are still there. I don't know why it says circa 1955 structures, but um, that was in 2005. But then when we go out there, next slide, please. Um, it was all gone. And so that one uh, was not recorded on the HPI. For some reason, it was still up on the um, assessor's webpage. 
So one of the things that happens is when a structure is demolished, the assessor takes it down. It doesn't delete the information. They still hold on to it, but for some reason they pull it down so you can no longer see uh, any information about the house. Next slide, please. Um, many times it's past time for the house to come down, um, but that still doesn't mean that there isn't history to learn from it before it's gone forever. Documenting the structure one way or the other can preserve something, if only a record of the building's existence and appearance. This house was built circa uh, 1870 by original settler John Probstel, for whom that uh, portion of Clark County is named. When Clark County Historical Museum Director Brad Richardson heard about it, he and photographer Chris Walsh managed to document the house before its demolition. But that was really only through word of mouth that he was able to find that out and get out there before it was demolished. And as you can see, I mean, it's in rough shape, but the history behind it is pretty cool. And inside they found, you know, piano and, and just, you know, I mean, there was his, you know, artifacts laying around in there. So it was pretty cool. Um, and you can see the quote from Brad up on the top. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2018, the Columbian did a, um, an article about it and um, quoted me as being baffled. But um, in a sense, I am. You know, when we have this, you know, we have this commission. We have um, a lot of, you know, I mean, our, our motto in the county is, um, you know, about our past. And, and so it just uh, strikes me that, um, and I, it's odd that we don't have any way to, to catch this. Um, and, and it does say that the assessor's office deletes the historical information, but like I said, it, it, that's not accurate. Um, next slide, please. So I had a test case kind of land in my lap. Um, there was a, a, oh no, this was a, okay. Um, so 701 East McLaughlin House was a large for uh, American force square style house that I always drove by on my way to work and I really liked the house. Um, but it had sat vacant for years and I suspected that, um, you know, demolition through neglect was on its way. Uh, sure enough, eventually it was demolished in 2016 and subsidized housing was built on its site. And when I went to go look at the assessor's page for it, this is what it shows up. So it's you see there's no building, um, there's no photo, there's no information about when it was built, everything is just gone. So uh, in order to find out about it, you'd have to call or email the GIS department, the assessor's department, um, somebody, and they might get back to you in a week or two about it. But um, So I decided to go looking for examples of demolition permits and processes uh, around the country that do incorporate some sort of consideration for historic structures. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but starting with Clark County, I wanted to look at their uh, demo permit application, which is one page and has uh, two questions about the structure. What type of structure is it and how big is it? And those are the only two questions. Next. Uh, City of Vancouver has three questions. The type, the size, and the description of the demolition. Uh, next, please. So going to other places, um, I landed on Ukiah, California. Uh, smaller town, uh, 16,000 people in 2017. We now are up to 190,000. Ukiah, uh, if the building is uh, over 50 years old, the permit may need to be considered by a demolition permit review committee to assess whether or not the structure has historic or architectural significance. And that committee will make a recommendation to the city council and the city council makes a final determination. Uh, you can see up at the top of that permit uh, application, there is reference to code UCC section um, 3016. Um, so I decided to go looking for that, and there's a lot of text on the next page. Um, but as you, the, the main point of this is that there is a very involved process in Ukiah, California, for trying to demolish a historic structure, including public hearings, like I mentioned, and the, it being recommended to the city council, and the city council getting involved in making a. Um, and next slide. Um, and if it's Oh, yep, that one. Um, 
and then looking for alternatives, you know, in terms of market value and reasonable return. So anyway, this, this felt like a pretty heavy lift. Uh, next one, looking for a demolition permit from other municipalities, uh, Walla Walla, Washington, population 32,000 in 2017. Um, they have, uh, you know, I highlighted the sentence that buildings 50 years older uh, require a 10 business day historic review. Um, and then there's a, a and then they also have um, an area down there that says provide photos of each interior room and every exterior face of the structure for any structure over 50 years old. So here we're starting to see a little bit of documentation built into the demo application process, um, but they also have a, a historic review process. Next page, please. And there is a sort of a, um, a phased approach where first there's a 10-day holding period, and if the structure um, possesses sufficient historic or architectural significance, it could be um, subject to a 60-day stay. Um, and then uh, also involves a public hearing and um, and I think there's even, and then they, they also consult with, with DAP over it. Um, and I think somewhere in there, there may even be up to a year if the structure is considered significant by all the parties involved and then looking for alternatives for, for demolition. Um, next slide. So in this process, I contacted DAP to see if they had any examples of municipalities that um, have some kind of review process, and they pointed me to Bellingham, Washington. Um, for them, what they do is uh, a demolition of a historic structure can trigger SEPA, the State Environmental Policy Act. Um, so uh, SEPA is interpreted at, 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 at the jurisdictional level. Um, so Clark County has a code that says SEPA and county decisions, and it lays out how they interpret SEPA. Um, so that would be one option in terms of um, doing that. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that kind of came to the conclusion is that there's this spectrum between documentation, minimal documentation, you know, four photos of the exterior of a building, and preservation. And somewhere in the middle, there's a review period to figure out what, what should be done with a, with a house. Um, you know, at one end, there's the bare bones documentation. At the other end, the full blown effort to preserve a structure. Uh, to begin with, we decided to consider what minimal documentation would look like when implementing into the demolition permitting process. It seemed that the easiest, most streamlined documentation would be taking the information already kept by the Clark County Assessor's Office and transferring it to the Washington HPI. Remember that the HPI is just an inventory of historic properties that is free, held in perpetuity, and open to the public. It also allows for updated information to be added to it, and it's a statewide central repository managed by the state agency mandated to keep this information. Um, next slide. So at this point, this is where my test case landed in my lap. Um, I was at a party talking to a client who's a contractor and he was telling me about a historic home that he was going to demolish soon um, because the new owners of the property wanted a bigger more modern house um, and I knew exactly which house it was because I've always been fascinated with one particular architectural detail of this house which I will get to later the suspense I'm sure is killing you guys um, Next slide, please. The house was originally built in 1910. The Clark County Assessor's page said that um, oh, it also had an effective date of, eight, of 1940, which means that there were um, significant up, uh, remodel or something happened in 1940. And the condition codes all said good. So the house wasn't in a state of ruin or uh, going through a neglect. Um, next slide. Um, here are the building cards for the house. You can see the massing, uh, square footage, uh, that, that kind of thing. Next slide, please. Uh, I went to the permits page, and sure enough, you can see that there were demolition permits uh, pending in 2019. So that's the, uh, you, you know the demolition's coming when you see that. Next slide. 
So um, I asked my acquaintance if I could come document the house, thinking that it wasn't on the HPI. And he said yes, and we met up at the house, and I photographed it as though it was the last time anyone would ever be able to photograph, photograph it. Um, the architectural detail that I always liked, if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you see the garage, which is well separated from the house. And as I would drive by, I'd always think, there must be a tunnel that's connecting the interior of the house to that garage. And sure enough, that in the middle of the, in the middle photo there, that's the tunnel leading to the garage, which I just thought was a really cool, cool detail of otherwise cool house, but it was, he was already starting to do the demolition inside, so I mainly focused on the exterior. Um, and in 2019, uh, next slide, that, that's the framing of the new house that's going in. It's, of course, done by now, so um, you can drive by 21st and Franklin, beautiful house, just not the house that was there. Um, so when I brought this up at an HPC meeting, uh, a member of the public and a former HPC commissioner, uh, Holly Chamberlain, I think, um, informed me that this house should have been part of the Haug neighborhood inventory that was carried out by the city in 2008. So I tracked down that document from, uh, from, the, from DAP, and sure enough, next, next slide, the house was included in that inventory of the neighborhood and was considered uh, one of the structures that was eligible for listing on the National Register. Uh, as you can see in the tiny writing on the right. Next slide, please. And the neighborhood in which it's located was nominated to the Washington Heritage Register. Um, Haug neighborhood is on the Washington Heritage Register for encompassing the largest collection of still extant pre-war, pre-World War II housing in Vancouver. It is now one house less, um, or several. Next slide, please. Um, and because it was inventoried then, I figured it was on the HPI, went to look for it on the HPI, and yes, it had been documented, and well documented at that, and uh, the, the Folks who had inventoried it also said that it was eligible for listing on the National Register. For all the good that it did in terms of its demolition, which was none. So, next slide, please. So, the, the, it kind of brings us to the next question, which is what can, should, do we want to do about this and how to implement some kind of review and whether that review involves documentation of the structure before it's demolished or a review to consider its historic significance or a review to think about actually preserving it and options other than demolition. Um, we, you know, we were trying to brainstorm the most streamlined methods of documentation um, that would be available to the public in perpetuity. For me, putting it on the HPI would be the central place to do it. Uh, it sounds so simple on the surface, but uh, as with everything, you know, the devil is in the details. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the questions that we came up with would, you know, what would involve code changes? Who would write the new code? Um, who's responsible for documenting the structure, filling out the HPI, assessing the structure's significance? Are there any municipal municipalities that are addressing this in precisely the same way, and could we use theirs as a, as a template? Um, that often is, is hard because, you know, you, you get an eye, you, you pull something from another municipality and you think it's going to work, and then staff lets you know that it doesn't jive with their process. So, um, to that end, the uh, HPC secured a $5,000 grant from DAP and hired a consulting firm, next. Um, and next slide. And after several months, the uh, folks at AECOM who was hired uh, produced a draft memo, and I don't know if they ever finalized it. I have copies of the draft memo. If anybody's interested, I have two copies. Um, essentially, they went through the same 
process that I had spent the last year and a half previous um, going through looking at um, different jurisdictions and whatnot, um, the overview of existing policies and all of that. Um, the thing that I was most interested in was what they recommended, the changes to the, to the demolition review uh, process for Clark County and its seven cities, including specifications for building age, photography, and documentation. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, based on the project goals and the analysis of the uh, certified local government demolition review programs in Washington and other states, uh, I don't know why I redacted that. I think it was for AECOM, uh, has prepared several demolition review pro program proposals for Clark County. These proposals will be refined following a workshop um, with the Clark County Planning and Clark County Historic Preservation Commission with final recommendations will be presented. Did that ever happen? I'm curious. I, I, I don't know if COVID came along and might have scuttled that. Is that, is that true? Okay. So I think we're still sort of in that draft memorandum stage. Um, so next slide, please. Some of their recommendations were um, age. You know, 50 years is the standard. For Section 106 for big projects, you might have 45 years because projects may take several years. Um, another option would be setting a date, like you know anything pre-1945. Uh, anyway, they came up with several um, several criteria for uh, maybe triggering uh, extra scrutiny during the demolition review process. Location, you know, obviously historic neighborhoods might do it. Uh, overlay zones, that kind of thing. And then seeing if um, any of these buildings are on existing registers and inventories. Very few are. So we have a lot of historic buildings in the county and very few are on any kind of register. Um, the Clark County Heritage Register is the only one with teeth. Uh, even the National Register has basically no teeth when it comes to demolition. But very few um, homes are on uh, the Clark County Heritage Register. And, you know, they're put on mainly by the owners who really value it. They're not going to be the ones who are going to be putting in for demolition uh, of their structure. So, um, next slide. Um, so, what we're really considering are two interrelated things. How much can we intervene, and what are the logistics of implementing that intervention? Each informs the other, which is a big part of why this has been a challenging uh, endeavor. We're looking at far more than just pointing to an example we like from another city and copying it. We need something that works within the permitting workflow of our local jurisdictions. Oftentimes, a jurisdiction wants a policy, finds one they like, and are about to adopt it, and then staff lets them know just how big, uh, how, how, what a heavy lift that would be to do in their system. The policy often then fails either because the practical realities prevent them from adopting it or prevent them from enforcing it. Our goal, my goal, is to come up with a workable solution before uh, the fabric and character of our communities is oops, lost forever. And uh, that's pretty much it. I, you know, I, I'm at the end of my, the, the next couple of slides are promoting things like the app and stuff of the HPC. Um, I, you know, I, I think three years ago, two years ago, I was more on that preservation side of the spectrum. Now I just would like to see them documented in some way um, before the, the demolition goes through. I, I almost feel like the easiest thing would be for the assessors to just leave all the information up and just say demolished next to it and have, if a new structure has taken a pl its place, you know, that both of them would be up there and accessible. So, um, but any, does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, Andy. Um, you had the first exemplar of the house that uh, you had the photograph, and then you saw the space where the house used to be. You said it uh, was there sometime between 2009 and 2011. Was that the one um, at 72nd Avenue and 119th Street? No, I think that one was in downtown. I think that one was in Shumway neighborhood. Okay. Or, yeah, I think it was 
right downtown. Because something similar happened the one where that development is being uh, uh, implemented on the, I guess it would be the northeast corner of that intersection. I, I would say it happens about once a week for us. It, it, it's really, I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, shocking. I, I mean, it, we go out in these farm, you know, we expect to see a farmstead and there's nothing. There's just holes in the ground and concrete foundation. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's happening. And, and the thing is, is, once they're gone, I mean, they're just, they're gone. And maybe a, each individual house isn't individually important, but, um, you know, taken together, we're, we're kind of losing that history. And for folks who maybe grew up in the, in the house or something, they have no way to go back and, and do any kind of research on it or anything like that. So um, it just, you know, it feels like it, it shouldn't be that, that big uh, an ask to have folks that are going to demolish a hundred year old house, submit four photos, one from each angle and submit it. You know, maybe that would be something to do. Or like I said, I mean, it feels like the easiest thing would be for the assessors to just not take down the information. Just Put a little star asterisk that says demolish. Send them to the existing one. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question for you, Alex. Yeah. So I know you were on the committee that did this you, when you do this professionally, but then you also, when you were on the preservation mm -hmm. commission, worked with others, right, to kind of come up with a proposal. So my, I guess my question is, if that's kind of the simplest fix, or say the first step of the simplest fix. Um, did you guys determine if that's something that our commission would need to petition the county to make that adjustment? Like, what what would be the steps? Like, I hear that recommendation, but what do we? You know, how does that? Unfold? The, the last hand I shook before the shutdown was Mayor Ann's hand. She had lunch with each chair of each commission, and I, I had lunch with her, and I brought this up to her, Jan. I think you were there. And she was very supportive. And she said, yeah, let's get something. Let's get something moving. Well, of course, the next day, um, everything shut down. I, I feel like starting with the city of Vancouver would be the easiest. Um, you know, it's a smaller jurisdiction and things tend, the way Vancouver goes, other municipalities I feel like might be more willing to follow suit. Um, you know, I feel like the politics are maybe a little easier in the in the city than the county. Um, but so I, I feel like maybe starting with the city, um, you know, and, and this commission being a both city and county commission, certainly within your right to write a letter or request a meeting or, or something to that effect. Um, and I'd be happy to join if if you wanted, um, but. Yeah, it just, um, you know, years of sort of spinning and banging my head against a wall and, and just seeing this happening over and over and over again. And, you know, just seeing those one page demolition permits that, you know, I hear get turned around in 48 hours. And it's like, oh man, 120 year old house just poof, gone. So, you know, we had one internal staff meeting to talk about the logistics of Clark County not taking stuff off their website and not burying it where people couldn't find it without emailing GIS and and then COVID hit and yeah it all screeched to a halt. So we had at least started the conversation. I don't even think it's the same staff people anymore. Well, and, that, and that's it. You know, I mean, it feels like we're, we got to, you know, three steps into it and now we're back at step one just because, you know, COVID and new staff and new members. So I have a question which I know Bart or Susan will not be able to answer but can possibly find the answer. We had the grant from DAP, mm -hmm. and there was two steps left on that grant, which was the presentation here and the presentation to the Clark County Planning Commission. Those probably didn't happen. So the question is, did that grant get closed out or and a report? Because DAP requires a written report on the outcome of the grant. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering whether Bart or Susan could find out, did that happen? Is there still money sitting there for the consultant to finish their work? Because that would be good for us to know whether um, there's a potential to just pick this back up again yeah. 
and go on with those next couple steps. And then uh, for Mark, and I don't know if Jason is on tonight, but you know, it, it would be really good if the city could start this conversation internally again about, you know, how comp, I mean, the GIS system is the counties. It's not, right. it's not the cities. So, um, so anything that happens that is electronic is gonna have to have the county's concurrence. But Vancouver could certainly add additional questions to the demo permit and require, you know, the photography. The question that arises is, who's going to monitor that? How does it get uploaded to the, you know, state well, system? So, to do a historic property inventory form, you don't need to be a professional. We'll just start there. No, anyone can do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not cumbersome. Um, it's free, and there are tools and people to help you at DAP. Um, I personally lean away from the assessor and more towards DAP being the keeper of the information because that information is out there in a public format and you can go look up your old house if it is on there and you can get a little bit more information from that document. Um, I work in the Columbia Gorge National Scenic Area and you know the, it is standard procedure you know to, that you record all of your building 50 years or older on an HPI form. And they don't even, I don't even have to determine significance for them, even though I do it anyways, because I can't stop. Um, but uh, it's not even a requirement. So I actually don't think it would be that cumbersome even for, for, for a person to fill out their historic property inventory form and submit it. So that, you're saying that could be a requirement of who, whoever is requesting the demo permit is not only do they submit photographs, but they fill out that they have to fill right. Out and it's basically like you're saying it's it's survey light or whatever you want to call it. You don't have to get into the whole history of the house and the history of your neighborhood and and to build the significant statement, which is the ultimate goal. But it might cause a review if you can if you can work with DAP and have them do a you know a quick review. They can they they could see that that was part of the whole neighborhood, and they would have raised a red flag. You know, and that might have slowed that process down for that building to go to come down. Um, so I'm an advocate of, of pursuing um, doing a historic property inventory form. And, and that's where I was three years ago. I, you know, for me, the HPI is the central repository of all of our state's historic structures, yep. buildings, bridges irrigation canals. And yeah, there are two levels of recording. There's reconnaissance level and intensive level. And reconnaissance level is for four exterior photos and a you know a, a basic architectural write-up, and if you have any history on it, add that in there for sure. So yeah, I mean, but you know, what what is an easy thing for you and I to do to have Joe homeowner do? Right, you'd have to you'd have to work you know with probably you know a developer to make you know a form or something that is not what it is right now, yeah. you know, going through Wizard, um, but making it more uh, user friendly, you know, where you can actually just upload your photos and type into a form and hit submit, and not really, you know, go through some of the extra steps that it goes through. When you know, it Joe, Joe property owner is not going to be tearing down his own house. Well, that's true. Well, and yeah, and There's for going to be a contractor. It's yeah. going to be a contractor, and that's well, Joe contractor is. isn't going to do it either. Well, <laughs> that, dep Joe that depends on your contract. But he has to do it in order to get the demo permit. Yeah. Right, and that's right. A, and that's where I mean I work with only two developers here in town, but both of them know that I I don't work next to holes. Mm -hmm. I won't work on that project. Call me first. Let me record the house. Let me finish that step first. And it's taken years, but. You know, they are on board with that now. It's really easy for them now, but it, it did take two years to, and a lot of, you know, encouragement. I mean, that's where the pushback and a code change would come is the developer saying, oh, you're making this so much harder for us or the oh, I, company. I know. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, and I mean, they have it so hard. You know. Right. Alex, so. do you think this uh, initiative might be a good joint project? between Historic Preservation Commission and the Culture Arts and Heritage Group? I floated it at our um, retreat back in, in during the winter, and um, people were receptive, but I think it, it's enough outside, their, outside the comfort zone of most of those members, um, but they did recognize it as a possibly uh, attainable goal, and so that was attractive for them. 
I've kind of let it ride because I wanted to touch base with you guys and kind of check in to just see like, has this ever been finalized and do we have anything, you know, and I know that discussions had been started and, you know, obviously everything shut down. So um, I just wanted to see where, where things are because I don't want to start making mountains out of molehills if, the, you know, if they've already been addressed. So, um, but I would be happy to bring it back up with them. Mark, do you think, I'm going to put you on the spot here, <laughs> I think the, the planning staff would be willing to have a conversation about what this might look like if we were going to make some kind of a change? Yeah. Before we go off and start lobbying the mayor? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a two-pronged approach, right? I think we can meet internally, but it's definitely something that's going to have to come from a policymaker, right? Yeah. Ulti ultimately. But but you and I both know if staff is adamantly opposed to it, it's probably not going to make it very right. far. No, and, we, and like you said, Jan, we did have some conversations before, and we bumped up against the same thing. Where will these pictures live? Right. What's going to be the process? Mm -hmm. The reality is we have the documentation that Alex has, has, has talked about already. So do you think we need a, a committee like we had before to kind of continue with the next steps in terms of finding out where we stand with the DAP grant and what needs to what needs to happen to bring that to fruition and then revisit some of these next steps that got sidelined because of COVID? I mean, I think the first step is to, for Bart and Susan to find out where, you know, if there's still grant money, if that contract with the consultant A. A AECOM is still open, or whether that's all been closed out and there was some kind of final report submitted. Um, and then I think, yeah, I think it would be helpful to have a subgroup of this group that, you know, even like two people mm -hmm. that could meet with, you know, city st staff and start that conversation about, you know, what, you know, not making it an undue burden on any, you know, on the developer or the demo company or the staff, but some way to just capture this information. It's very basic. And then they've got to talk to GIS. Uh, when I saw this item on the agenda tonight, I, something rang a bell and I thought I would try to clear the fog from my brain cells and look back at some of our prior agendas. And um, back in October of 2020, um, September, October, um, we had a subcommittee of this commission that did review the recommendations in Alex's memo that looked at the AECOM draft memo and that prepared some recommendations and they were brought to the commission. Okay. And the commission did enact a unanimous motion asking the county staff to do some follow-up on that and consider adding that to their work program. So I know that there's been some back and forth and, you know, staff changes and of course all the COVID shutdowns and all that, but I, I think we can reassure Alex that back in October of 2020 at least, you know, the ball was picked up and there were some discussions had and some additional um, research requested of staff and I'm sure they can dig into that um, when they look at the status of the grant as well. <clears throat> yeah, that would be great to know where it got left. Does anybody want a copy of the AECOM draft? Can you give a copy to Susan so she can scan it and send it to all of us? Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. This is important. We need to not let the ball get dropped on this. Hopefully yeah. not another pandemic that gets in the way. Yeah, no more. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Alex. The next agenda item is a heritage overlay review for a mural at 614 Main Street in Vancouver. Although this is a public meeting, it is not a public hearing. We will be accepting public comment on this topic after the applicant presentation. But I must ask, do commission members have any ex parte contacts or conflicts of interest for this case? Being done, we'll welcome uh, Mark Pearson 
from the City of Vancouver who will now make a presentation. Thank you, Chair Greg. This is uh, the mural at 614 Main Street, the Lucky Loan building that I believe, uh, pardon me, the time is just slipping from my brain. I don't know when we looked at these improvements, but sometime in the past year, right? Right. I think yeah. many of us went out there and yeah. right. toured, got to tour the building this spring, and it was really exciting. So one of the new tenants is, uh, I believe, living, living Room Realty. And they've come forward and asked us to review uh, a proposed mural on the other side of the property. Sorry, who's the tenant? Living Room. Okay. Um, I, I believe. Uh, but, but let me give a little more background. Sorry, I, I got uh, uh, off on a tangent there. So this, the, the 614 Main Street is within our heritage overlay number two. It's, the building is not on the local, state, <clears throat> or uh, national register. But per our code, per the Heritage Overlay Code, uh, exterior alterations are subject to advisory review by the HPC. And it does explicitly mention uh, murals in here. Um, I'm not sure I've, I've brought a mural to this group before. And I know murals have, have gone up. Uh, in, in, our, in our heritage overlay, so I, I, I applaud the applicant for coming forward and, and looking at the process and, and bringing it to this group. Now, our standards uh, are the Secretary of the Interior's uh, standards for rehabilitation. I've included those with your packet. In my view, you know, the mural is, isn't really touching on, on these for the most part, but I, again, because it's in the heritage overlay. I don't think we got the uh, standards. Okay, I didn't print those out. It's in the packet that uh, Susan oh, handed the, out. The, the online Separate stuff. Separate from the other one. I'm, I'm getting used to being in, back in reality. <laughs> but there, I mean, I can go through them really quick. I mean, it's basically the use, historic character of the property. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and on, on page uh, on page two of my little memo here, I have the most up to date rendering that the applicant has provided. And I think uh, in the online information, there should be some earlier renditions that are mostly the same concept. I think just some, um, uh, thanks to Bart, uh, different components of Vancouver identified in their mural and in one of the uh, slides. There. Is this the north wall? They're Thank proposing you, Jim, to put it on. This will be the north wall facing 7th Street. And Bart, if you could go to the second slide, they've kind of done a, a, a oh, superimposed it on on the on the wall there, as you can see. And again, okay, this is already done. So that's <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like they opened that up yet. That wall. And it, it, this is up, well, this is an older street view. You can still see the um, policeman in the upper left corner there. I think oh, luckily, yeah. luckily they're gone now. <laughs> Just looking for feedback from staff. I do believe, I'm flying blind over here, I don't know who is online, uh, Susan, but I know Whitney is the person I've been dealing with, but I think the mural uh, artist was going to try to join us tonight, too. I can't remember what their name was. Uh, there's someone named Annalisa. That sounds right. Would you like me to, and she has her hand up. <laughs> but, um, yeah, before before we let the applicant speak, is there any pro procedural questions I can answer? No. Great. So we're going to hear from the applicant now. I'm unmuting Annalisa's uh, microphone right now. You're unmuted, Annalisa. Yeah, so I've been working on this project for the last year and the um, design of the second floor. And through this process, we've been committed to preserving the historical elements of the property um, and, you know, bringing in vintage light fixtures and so forth and just trying to preserve as much as possible um, what was originally at the property or what would have been at the property um, with the elements that we brought in. Um, and so in thinking about the mural on the side there, uh, we wanted to represent the city of Vancouver 
um, within the imagery, but also in the text, lucky to be living in Vancouver to uh, uh, kind of inspire people um, to feel proud about living in the city of Vancouver. So Living Room Realty is a real estate company. And so our aim is to, of course, um, foster growth of community. And that's um, represented here in this mural. May I ask a question? Sure. Yes. Okay. There are two renderings. There's the one that we see right now that's superimposed on the building, and then there's another one that's very similar, just restructured. Is there a decision being made about which one is desired is going to be used? Yeah. So if you or can scroll up on um, the larger image, yeah, at the top there. So um, we we're going with this version at the top. Um, we're actually in, in process of considering removing the lucky loans image that's right to the right of the fish um, and replacing it with the I-5 bridge. Um, of course, the lucky loan sign is a nod to the building and what it's you know been used as for the last several years. Um, but we're not sure if that's something that needs to be included on that versus representing details of the city of Vancouver. So in just one in just one way, mention here. If you do go ahead and include the lucky loan, it's lucky loan, not loans plural. Okay. So it would be a shame to have it read lucky loans in a permanent mural. And commissioners and, and Annalisa, the, the one I printed out is the, the one that Whitney had sent me on, on Friday, so on, on 7 1. So this, this is the one should be the most. It has the bridge. Yeah, it has the bridge here. Perfect. Instead of the lucky yeah. one. Okay. Any further questions on the part of the commission or the applicant? I have one other small question. Go ahead. In the image of the building right now, the building is brown, painted brown, it looks like. Is that mm -hmm. the case or is that proposed it will be painted brown and then this mural will be put on top of that? Or is the that already building, the color scheme? Yeah, we've left the building brown and it will remain brown. Any member of the public have a comment? I do not see any hands raised. Staff will now provide instructions on how to make a public comment, but seeing none, staff will now respond to comments from the applicant and the public. Mark, do you have any further comments? Nothing additional for me, Chair. Thank you. The Commission will now deliberate. And at the end of the deliberation, I'll accept a motion for a recommendation to the City of Vancouver. Input from colleagues. Well, I, I think that the mural design is muted. It's not really um, bright, which I, I appreciate. I appreciate the neutral tones. Um, I think painting on buildings is temporary not a permanent change. Um, I don't personally see a problem with putting a mural on the north side of the Lucky Loan, especially one with so much um, thought put into it. It's, it's paint. It's, <laughs> it can always be painted over. It's not in any way going to damage the his, actual historic character of the building. And it's attractive. It will just continue yeah, to attractive be attractive in the, in the neighborhood in the overlay. Yeah. Bring people in rather than repel them, which is always good. 
Yeah, I'll also have to say I really, I really enjoyed the mural. I think it looks really, I really appreciate all the different detail. It ties in um, Vancouver, things that are iconic to this area. I guess my one thought, though, is if you are considering taking out Lucky Loan, I, I think that is a nice nod to the history of the building. I think that a lot of people, at least local people, would recognize that and would would appreciate that. That's just, you know, this is advisory, so you can do what you want with it. But I, I did like to see that. That was that was nice. But I, I like the look of the one that you have decided you would, um, your prefer, you're going to go with. So I don't know if you were, would swap something out in order to put the lucky loan in if you decided to go that way. But either way, I think it's, um, I think the presentation is is very, up, like you said, uplifting. It's very positive, um, and I think murals really add value to a space. And like we've, you know, our our role is to determine if anything will, you know, negatively impact the historic um, integrity of the building. And this, as we've talked about, won't. So I personally think this is a really nice. I enjoyed the fact that the cursive L's are an homage to the former Lucky Lager Brewery, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that uh, the Lucky Loan was so named mm. <laughs> because it was a place where uh, some of my former colleagues at General Brewing would, well, uh, receive loans. <laughs> that was one of the, uh, the historic reasons for calling it Lucky Loan mm. before the what do you think, Greg? Looks great. <laughs> Pardon? I asked him yeah, what he no, thought. Looks great. Well, we take a motion to accept. I'll move to accept the proposal for the mural. Is there a second? Second. I'm going to move to seconded that uh, the mural be approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I would like to say I, I wish other building owners would take this much care with the design of their mural. Susan, we can please note that it was a unanimous vote. Elaine, did you get to vote on that issue? Sorry, I didn't hit the mute button fast enough. I agree with this. I think it's a lovely image that will, it's an ode to Vancouver. It's paint, it's not going to destroy pieces, so I say approved. Okay. We hadn't forgotten that you were there. <laughs> Greg, sorry, what? Photo, photo evidence is telling me it's Lucky Loan and Lucky Loans. It looks like the vertical hanging sign says Lucky Loans, and the horizontal painting on 6 Main says Lucky Loan. So maybe a half an F. <laughs> Depends on which door you enter. <laughs> Depends on. Leave it to the planner. You're both you right. Plan. right. How much you're loaning. Yeah. Both right. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification, Mark. <laughs> <clears throat> we have some committee updates and announcements. Bart will now give us an update on the position vacancies and the application review subcommittee. Yeah, give me one second here while I change screens. There's no visuals for this, so I'll just uh, go back to the and, uh, um, so we have um, Elaine Thatcher on the on uh, the web interface this evening, and she is our newest member. So welcome, Elaine. She was approved by the uh, county commission and uh, signed her letter um, a couple. Three weeks ago, maybe, and along with Julie for her reappointment, and so we still have Julie with her continuity of service. So that's wonderful. And um, my understanding from Jason is that we also are very close to the approval of the recommended um, Vancouver appointed position, but they had to postpone their consent uh, item from their uh, a June, June date uh, to uh, July. Do you remember what it is? Remember next Monday as I looked at the council agenda. And the 11th. The 11th. The 11th. Um, and so we can, um, fingers crossed, hope that uh, 
our new member is uh, official by then, and we will be fully staffed up. Um, again, I, I'm not putting resumes and names uh, on the record at this point until it's official, but uh, uh, the committee, the selection recommendation committee uh, knows who it is and city staff knows who it is, and we felt it was a strong candidate. Um, so that's all I have to add about that committee. Um, on a separate item, um, with all the busy busyness of working on the new appointments, we had to kind of um, pump the brakes a little bit on our uh, bylaws and um, rules and procedures uh, update project, which everyone has been waiting with bated breath <laughs> to keep moving. Um, Susan has been very patient with me as I've been the, the main drafter of the edits. And um, so we are to the point where we're getting that to uh, our county land use attorney to take a look. And it's possible that we will have a uh, draft product for you folks to look at next meeting. But that's going to depend on um, the attorney's workload and, and what level of edits um, Chris Cook suggests at that time. Um, so stay tuned. And that project is not forgotten and is moving along. And that's all I have. Thank you, Barry. Now new business. Uh, we'll now hold elections for chair and vice chair on the Historic Preservation Commission for the coming year. I've expressed an interest in continuing as chair, and Jan Bader has expressed an interest in continuing as vice chair. So uh, now we'll have motions and uh, for the chair position. All by a second. Well, I appreciate the two of you putting your names forward. I really was happy to see <laughs> that you both chose to reapply. So um, I would put forward that both Andy Gregg and Jane Bader, um, that their applications be approved for the positions they've submitted for. I'll second that. Thank you. I'm wondering if they should be separate motions or can they go together? I think they can go together. Okay. We're I wasn't part of the last one. Slate. So. You're approving the slate. A slate. I, I think, All right. I think we're uh, to be respectful of everyone's time to uh, to have uh, one vote would be appropriate. Uh, so it's been moved and seconded that I continue as chair and Jen continues as vice chair. And so. Um, we need a roll call vote for this. So, Jan. Aye. Julie. Aye. I vote aye. Morgan. Aye. Greg. Yes. Elaine. Aye. So, uh, the motion has passed, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your, uh, for your support. I really appreciate it, and we'll uh, continue to. Uh, Follow your directives best I can. Okay. Um, Susan, uh, it's time to discuss revitalized Washington conference attendance, which we preliminarily did last month. And uh, the only one that was uh, question was the uh, national conference in Cincinnati, but uh, with Julie's reappointment, that's been settled. So if you could give us an update, I'd appreciate it. Yes. So in your packet um, and on the screen is some updated budget information. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, is some updated budget information. And I just made a few tweaks adding um, the Cost, the actual cost for uh, the NAPC forum. Um, and one of the things I would like to uh, get some clarification from you on is I did the best I could on an estimate, but it really depends on some of the things that the person chooses and um, it, can, it can vary. And um, in the case of the NAPC forum, the conference hotel was not available anymore, and so the hotel cost um, 
was um, over the estimate. And you can see that on the back side, um, page two of the, of the information. And I'm going to scroll down on the screen as well. So um, the hotel ended up being more expensive. We needed to get Julie's reg reservation done as soon as possible because that conference is coming up here in just a few days. So uh, I talked to Jackie and she thought um, we could approve that cost. But I would, I would like to make sure that you're all comfortable with making those kinds of changes as they come up. Um, you know, with in, I, I don't know exactly how to word it, but within reason or, you know, as those issues arise. Um, well, Susan, I think that uh, was the uh, decision of the commission to send these people right, yeah. to these uh, continuing education opportunities. And that we understand that uh, um, things like airfare and, and, and other vagaries room. play into it. I yes. think it's okay. not a material change. Yeah, it was okay. an estimate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Because that was also my concern. Yeah. yeah. Even the it's just was higher than what's listed. So thank you. Yeah. And it's nice to hear from you directly because we just didn't address that last time. So thank you. Um, and uh, I think both Morgan and Jan expressed interest in the revitalized Washington conference, but we did, you did approve uh, four attendees, and so we need to identify who those people would be. Were we thinking about um, uh, inviting some of our new, maybe uh, Elaine, maybe letting her know about the conference and maybe giving her a little more information since she's new? We did mention that to Elaine, and I'll let her speak for herself, but um, we did mention that to her in her um, orientation session, and I think she is uh, potentially interested, if possible. I'd like yes, to sorry, I'm that. here. I just wanted to make sure no one else was going to speak first. Um, the Revitalize Washington conference was brought to my attention um, upon my accepting this position. And I am very interested in going and having this educational experience, and I have already cleared for time off from my employer. Great. Great. Who else assembled would, is interested in going? Well, I'm already registered. Okay. Because <laughs> I understood from the last time that we were like, go. And so <laughs> wanted to take advantage of the early bird registration because it was cheaper. So for Revitalize Washington, it's Elaine, Jan, Morgan. Morgan. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll be here. That's all. So should we save one spot for sure. our, our commission yeah, to be added next month? And if they decide not to go, and Greg decides not to go, I yeah, you could go, or I could go. Or do but we I could feel go? like I'm taking the NATC, and I feel like that's a big slot, so. Well, no, I, I would like to defer to that because uh, these uh, opportunities are really investments. And I am likely to decline opportunities unless they're local. For instance, we have the one in uh, October, the APA Washington Conference. But these are investments in the Commission's future. And I'm term limited now and have one year to serve. And so for me to go to a conference when somebody else who has long service ahead of them would not be best practice. So I just wanted to let colleagues Susan or Bart, have you guys looked at the APA conference? Is there anything out on that yet? Because we were unclear if that was actually going to have anything that was going to be a benefit to this. Well, Jason sent me the contact information. And, okay. And you can enroll, but they didn't have any sessions. And it yeah. had been my hope that maybe this commission could um, make a presentation. Oh, some of our work. Oh. So, but, but it's still far enough away that they haven't uh, really said. So I, I'm, I tell you what, I'm monitoring it. Okay. And if I see something, I'll contact them. Yeah. I talked to someone that was, I think, on the planning committee for it, and they were like, "What? Why would you? Why would the preservation commission go to that?" Been suggested so. Um, if I could I pose a quick question for Revitalize Washington. Um, sorry, I don't know everyone's names yet. Uh, 
I think Jan had mentioned earlier that you'd already registered. Um, if Correct. you guys all agree that I should go, should I, Elaine Thatcher, register myself for Revitalize Washington, or is that something the com the commission will take care of? It, um, you need to work with Maria Ryan at the City of Vancouver. And I can send you her contact information. <laughs> this is Susan. thank you so much. So she just needs she just needs to know if you want to go to any of the uh, field sessions, which are remarkably cheap this year, and or and then what hotel you'd prefer to stay at. Perfect. Thank you. So maybe um, since it's off, it's not until October. Um, Greg, would we know from you soon enough for the fourth person, whether it's the new city person or? Yeah, I think I'll know within a month or so. Okay. We'll revisit this next month. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Time for good of the order. This is a time of our meeting where we uh, celebrate our successes and thanks to folks who have been uh, service to the commission. So I'd like to thank uh, Bart and Susan for setting up uh, this socially distant in-person session. I think it uh, worked out uh, far better than any that I expected. And uh, it was also delightful to have uh, members of the community join us. And it was, I felt like it was much easier to hear like Holly and mm -hmm. people that were calling in. So good job, you guys. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you one question about that? Do you like the layout? Do you, do you like facing the audience? I know you have to turn around no, no, to see to the, okay. It's not a big deal. Okay, great. And I guess I have a small, well, I have a good as order. To Very good. Two of you do for reapplying and being our leadership. I do admire the experience you bring to our commission and the work you have already um, contributed, not just here, but I know professionally you both bring a great deal of knowledge and, and wealth of experience. So I'm, I'm happy that you both were willing to continue in your, your roles on the commission. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. That's very kind of you to say. Any further? Thanks, everyone, and uh, I think it's, the time has come to uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. The meeting be adjourned. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, colleagues. Aye. And, and thank you, Elaine, for joining us. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm very glad that we have the remote option so that I'm able to uh, Conference in from two time zones away. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, everyone.